you have a handout coming out. You should get two pages, one front and back, and, and then a third one. Um, as always, I try to give you a lot of notes that you can uh, always look back at and, and receive some, um, some encouragement and, and guidance. This is our third message on a definition for evangelism. Uh, evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade, and that's where it's at. I, I worked on that a little bit, and I, at first I put uh, evangelism as preaching the gospel. And I thought, no, it, 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 too many times we, we use the word preaching, although teaching and preaching in this instance is the same. It's, it's ministry, it's conveying something. But I want you to realize that you don't uh, have to be a preacher to be able to convey the gospel. And uh, as we preached the first message on this, we talked about evangelism being an uh, introduction into the teaching of the gospel. So uh, evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. If you need an ink pen, raise your hand, you'll, somebody will get you one. Now, we're going to be talking about the aim this morning. And like I said, this is the third series on this. And the question is, how's yours? How's your aim? And th that graphic really does represent the church. Uh, or it represents the church and Christian people. We, we do a lot of things. And some of the things we may even do well, but are we hitting the bullseye? As, as the saying goes, are we keeping the main thing the main thing? And we, we've been commissioned by Christ to do a certain ministry. And that's what we want to encourage you with today. So the aim, how's yours? As servants who are commissioned to make disciples, while teaching the gospel... We must aim to bring about a mature person, one who measures up to the stature of Christ himself. See, the, the presentation of the gospel just begins when somebody accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We need to come alongside now and do some teaching, some encouraging that they measure up to the stature of Jesus Christ. Now, it's important if we're going to teach somebody how to measure up to the stature of Jesus Christ that you and I also measure up to the stature of Jesus Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, when we look into the spiritual mirror, what do we see? Do we see something that resembles more of the world in how we spend our time, how we spend our resources, how we go about with our relationships? Or do we see a reflection of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life? It's been said, if you show me your, if you show me your checkbook, I can show you where you're at in your relationship with God or the world. Because you're spending, I'm not saying that, that you're writing all these checks, that you have to write all these checks to the church or to ministry, but I am saying that your checkbook will tell a little bit about where your priorities are, what you spend your resources on. And I thought, that's, that's an interesting statement. Uh, I'm not yay or nay with it, but I thought it's an interesting statement, and it, it probably does point in a direction. So we're looking in the mirror, and we want to be able to see a life that is mature in its in its stature of, of Christ. So as we teach the gospel, we have an aim. So aim is a very small word, and it would be very easy to skip over it. And I think a lot of times we do. Matter of fact, I'm not real for sure if you've ever heard a message about aim in relationship to the gospel. 
or in relationship to evangelism. So our aim springs from understanding that everyone we talk to is headed to one of two ends. They're either heading to eternal life or they're heading to eternal punishment. Heaven or hell. We need to have an understanding of that. Everybody's going to live forever. One is going to have life and have it more abundantly in a place called heaven. The other is going to have eternal life, but that word is not a good definition for it because hell is an eternal death or an eternal separation from God. But you'll be conscious. In reality, none of us never have a time out. When our heart beats the last moment here, we become conscious someplace else right then. Sometimes we don't think about that. But our aim in presenting the gospel, we need to have a, a, some alarm bells going off. Our loved ones, our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, our co-workers are one heartbeat away from eternity. And that should get our attention. We don't just lay out the gospel facts haphazardly or with a mere head knowledge. It's important that we have an aim, that we have a direction in our gospel teaching. AIM reminds us that people need more than data transfer. I believe folks are longing for a purpose. They're longing for relationships that are real, friends that care and offer support. As Christians, we ought to apply ourselves to think through the reasons for the hope we have in Christ and how to convey convey these objections as a means that sweep aside their doubts and fears. People always have several reactions when you go to presenting them the gospel. There, there may be an awkward feeling. They may want to change the subject. They may get offended. But we need to convey our purpose to them in such a way that it sweeps away those fears, those doubts, those premonitions. And I believe we can do that. And I believe there's some good examples in scriptures that show us the way. So we, we want to we think through. We want to think through the reasons for the hope that we have in Christ. And with that generated enthusiasm, we share the gospel with those that we come in contact with. Met a man the uh, day before yesterday, well, it was yesterday, and uh, 28 years old, just a few seconds into it, he's cutting down some trees, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you right now, you seem like a nice young man, but I've got to ask you, are you a Christian? Are you saved? And he looked at me, he said, well, he said, I, I, I guess I am. He said, my grandpa's a preacher down in West Virginia, and I said, what? Don't make you a Christian. So we had a good talk. And I invited him out to church. I expect him to come sometime. But as Doug and I was talking yesterday, as we get older, we, we feel the pressing a little bit more urgent to ask folks about their eternal destiny, about whether they're saved or not. So we reach out to teach the facts of the gospel, and we remember that evangelism's aim helps us to be compassionate helps us to be understanding, and helps us to offer the gospel in a loving way. First Peter says this, but in your hearts, honor Christ. He's the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. I like that. Because a lot of times when we defend something, we get on edge and we get a little aggressive and maybe we look a little bit angry. But here, the, the Bible's telling us, yes, you can make a defense of your reason for the hope that you have, but do it with a gentleness and do it with a respect. Our aim is 
to persuade them to become a Christian. Not to get into an argument, not to get into a back and forth debate. Having an aim helps us maintain perspective on what we're doing. It directs us towards an end. Our aim helps us remember that there's much at stake. There, there's not a hodgepodge of things to choose from when it comes to um, choosing sides. There are two kingdoms at war. There's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And there's no in-between. You're either one or the other. You're the saved or you're lost. You're either good because of the righteousness of Christ or you're a child of your father, the devil. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't sound very gentle. But it's true. And we can convey that thought with gentleness and with love and with concern. When folks are born again, they pass from the rulership of the devil to the rulership of Christ. They are literally rescued from the domain of Satan and become partakers in the kingdom of God. That's a beautiful truth. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. See, as Christians, their sin nature is defeated. They went from bondage to freedom. See, without God's intervention, no matter how good a person is, no matter how well of a home he was raised up in, without God's intervention, sin rules over them. And it doesn't matter how much you love them. It doesn't matter how much you would give to them on their behalf. It doesn't matter how good they are. They are slaves to the desires of sin, unable to walk in holiness or please God at all. But through the new birth, they become new creations in Christ. And the rule of sin in their hearts is broken. That's our aim, to see that that rule of sin is broken in their hearts. Now, it doesn't mean that they automatically become Christians or automatically become perfect in the sense that they'll not make mistakes. It does mean they're going to have an advocate when they do sin, they can go to the Father through Christ. They're going to continue to sin, not as before, but that sin nature is going to be something that, that folks are going to have to struggle with until the day that you die. Matter of fact, that's why you die. But there's going to come a day when you're going to be glorified. Now, the controlling power of sin over an individual's life is defeated at conversion. And they're able to overcome, really, you're able to overcome all sin if you stay, pay attention to the leading of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit uh, is in you to guide you and lead you in all things that are true and right, but there's the desires of the flesh that the battle starts. And when you lose a battle and you trespass, There'll be something that's going to happen in your life that had never happened before. And it's called conviction. Conviction will cause you to back up and do the right thing. Where before you was under condemnation. But now conviction is a lot better ally than condemnation. So we, the, the, the sin that rules over an individual's life is no longer there. The Holy Spirit is there to lead and to guide. The Bible says in Romans, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Number three, they inherit eternal life. We spoke about it just a little bit ago. We usually think of eternal life as something we will experience later on, but the Bible teaches that we receive eternal life at the moment of conversion. 
My, my mother died several years ago, but she didn't cease to exist. She just made a transition. And she said, prior to her death, when my father said, Claudette, I'm still looking for a miracle. And my mother said, now, Billy, she said, if, if we don't get our miracle, that just means that God has got something greater than a miracle for me. She realized a couple weeks before she died that the transition from this life to the next was far greater than anybody being healed. I'll never forget that. I'll keep it as long as my faculties are able to recollect it. But we don't. We, we, we don't. we don't cease to exist. The death is just a separation from those on earth. There's a separation, and they're enjoying uh, their time in the paradise of God until time shall be no more, and then everybody will be ushered in to eternal existence someplace with bodies, with feelings, with thoughts. Every time eternal life is spoken of for Christians, it's done so in the present tense, meaning it's current, it's not future. It's a reality that happens right now at the time of conversion. The Bible says in the book of John, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Has eternal life. Not will have, but has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Though our bodies will die, our spirit is alive forever, and later on will be reunited with resurrected physical bodies. These are things we need to think about when presenting the gospel. Now, our example that we're going to use this morning is Jesus Christ. And there's others we could use, but I, I wanted to use his. Christ's aim. When, when Christ aimed at something, he hit it. The Bible says in the book of John, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now the word must... It means necessity, compulsion, destiny. Jesus was driven to go through Samaria for the sake of his mission. I, I find this fascinating. Now, he had a wide-ranging aim. And the wide-ranging aim was that Samaria needed the gospel. He came to the Jews those that wasn't split off from Samaria, the Samaritan and the Jews, they, they had a, a rift quite a few centuries ago, and they wasn't uh, compatible with one another in their own minds. But Christ said, I must needs go to Samaria. He, he had a humankind in mind when he was going to present the gospel. So it says, he must needs go through Samaria. So his wide-ranging aim was Samaria, and they needed the gospel. Now, Christ also had a focused aim. He, just like us, we should have a wide-ranging aim, which is the lost people in our community. But we ought to have some focused aims as they come in our crosshairs as we go through life. And the focused aim for Christ, when he left Judea, he had a purpose of meeting the Samaritan woman. I, I just find this story so fascinating. So here's Christ sitting on the well, and no doubt he was tired, and he was probably weary, and he was probably thirsty from his journey. While sitting there, one of the events for which he had come into Samaria began to unfold. He confronted the woman, and he had claims about who he was. He said, he was the Messiah. Now, we should have claims about who Jesus is. And we ought to have a broad focus, a broad agenda, and we also need to have a focused aim. So she came to draw the water, and he struck up a conversation by asking her for a drink of water. 
He was shocked. For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. She asked Jesus why he would ask her, a Samaritan, for a drink. It was this question, this subject of water, that Jesus took and began to use. Now, remember what I said earlier, that most folks are longing for purpose. They're longing for relationships that are real. Friends that care and offer support. I, I believe that's true for everybody. I believe that's where the gospel becomes intimate. I believe that's where the gospel becomes your, um, your ticket into people's lives. But it's important that you become real. It's important that you uh, lay aside the misgivings about speaking Christianese and, and just being made up. Be real. People are looking for real relationships, real friends. Now, this woman, she had many relationships. But there was something about the teaching of the gospel that birthed a hope, that birthed a purpose, an excitement, a wonder that she had never experienced before. Now, I want to just take a moment here because a lot of times I have heard people beat this woman up so bad. <laughs> but this is what Christ said, and I, I just added this this morning. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. So what you have said is quite true. Now, think through what Christ just said here. I, I, I find this remarkable. And no, not only, I, I can understand why she was just so taken and awestruck in what Christ said. He, he said, the fact is you have had five husbands. Now, think of this. Would Christ have said she had five husbands if she was in five adulterous affairs? No, he wouldn't have recognized them as her husbands. He recognized these five men as her husbands. He said, you have had five husbands. He didn't say you've had five illicit relationships. He didn't say you had five encounters where you lived in a state of adultery. He said, you've had five husbands. Now, I don't know what happened to these five husbands. Did they die? Were they unfaithful? I don't know. But she was in a relationship, and I contend that she was in a secret relationship because you just didn't do that in those days. You didn't flaunt scandalous living. But he, he said, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. I thought, wow, you know? I, I think Jesus just, no pun intended, but literally pulled the covers off. He pulled the covers off. And, and she was just so... Taken back. We're not going to go through the whole conversation. We may at a later date. And no doubt you've heard that area that, that, that preached several times, but there's some wonderful things that could be pulled out of that. So she had many relationships, but Christ birthed a hope, a purpose, and excitement, a wonder that she had never experienced before. The Bible says that she got so excited. Book of John says, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men. And that's not, a, that's not a, uh, a universal human term. This is masculine. She said unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? I, again, I, I, why did these men go out in droves to see Christ at this woman's testimony if she was a kind of a, you know, a lady of the night, so to speak. I wish I knew a lot more about her. 
I, I, I think we've been construed by some teachings about who she was. And I'm not finding much. I did some research, and it all kind of points to she was just a bad lady, but I, I'm not for sure. So, teaching, teaching the gospel, there was the proclamation that Jesus was the Messiah. Note the tender yet meaningful statement. The woman then left her water pot. She was very excited. The gospel had confronted her. She had actually met the Messiah. And he had met the need of her heart and life. And she had to tell everyone about him. Now, when she went in and shared her testimony to the men of Samaria, the, the city there, the Bible says the people responded. At least a good number did. The idea of the words came unto him. That phrase means as if there was a long streaming procession of people coming out of the city to the well. And the people kept on coming to him. There was something about this lady. There was something about her dynamic witness. There was something about the striking change seen in her life that caused this enormous response. Because of her witness, many set out to find the Messiah for themselves. This is what the Bible says in the book of John. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. Now, I don't know what he spoke in those two days. It must have been some remarkable teaching because it had an effect. And many more believed because of his own word. And they said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. And no, and that's a very strong word when you look it up, and no, when you know something, you know something, and know that this is indeed, without question, beyond the shadow of a doubt, you can take it to the bank, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. We need to have the ability to teach the gospel with the aim to persuade. We know that man has a thirst, and his thirst is much deeper than physical thirst. Man has an inner spiritual thirst, and that's what you're playing into. You know they do. We just need to think through how to teach, how to present the gospel to them. For the most part, they're miserable. Christ alone is the one who's able to satisfy the thirst of man. If man drinks of the water Christ gives, he is infused with purpose. He's infused with a meaning, with a significance. He has energy, he has motivation to go forward. Now, let, let's look at several facts about the living water. The living water comes from Christ. He and He alone is its source. This is what we aim to teach to the thirsty. It, it's not a Baptist it's not a Baptist doctrine, it's not a Catholic doctrine, it's not a Pentecostal doctrine, it's not the hoop and holler doctrine. It is Jesus Christ. It's Him. He alone is its source. It's not about emotion. Emotion is good and sometimes we can have it. But it's about presenting the truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth. And this is what we must aim to teach to those whom are thirsty. The Bible says in the book of John, in the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, 
Let him come unto me and drink. See, that living water keeps folks from thirsting again. Their inner thirst is gone forever. It's quenched. It's fully satisfied. And this becomes their testimony. Whatever your experience has been through life, the testimony is that, that all of life never brought the satisfaction that your relationship in Christ did. That becomes your testimony. That becomes your starting point to teach the gospel. And we all have one. We all have a story. We all have a testimony. The living water is a well of water placed in the person. The well is not placed outside the individual. It's not placed anywhere out in the world. It's not placed in the confession booth. It's not in their home. It's not in their business. It's not in your uh, local assembly. It's not in your, your church. It's placed in them. It's an artesian well that bubbles up from inside. In the book of John, it says, Whosoever, Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I, I always like the, just the little things that jump out at me. Why, why did Christ use the term rivers, plural? Why, why didn't he just say out of your heart will flow a river of living water? Why, why did he use plural? That, that's another message. But think about that sometime. Why do you use plural? Why do you say rivers of living water? He uses the same term in, in Psalms. Uh, be placed beside rivers of water. Now, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So this living water springs up and continues to spring up and bubble, like I said, like an artesian well, flowing on and on. It's always in motion. It's never stagnant. You're not going to call a, uh, a Holy Ghost indwelled Christian You'll never call in the Dead Sea because there's movement there. There's excitement there. There's bubbling there. It's evident all over them. There's something about a born-again Christian who wants to live his life in a manner that pleases God that cannot be hid. It's ever in motion. Living water, it springs up into everlasting life. And again, that will never end. In the book of Revelation, it says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Some of us are better painters than we are marksmen. And I've, I've used this little story so many times, some of you probably know it by heart. But the fellow is going into town with a buddy, and he's seen uh, these arrows right in the middle of all these bullseyes on the sides of buses, on mailboxes, hanging in the trees, up on the buildings, on garages, on barns. And he, he commented to his buddy, he said, you know, but somebody in this town is a really good shot. And as they went a little further, they seen another man painting bullseyes around stray arrows. And sometimes that's how we are. Some of us are better painters than we are marksmen. We want to know God's will. We want to follow his plan. We want things to go well for us. Will is described as the mental faculty by which one deliberately chooses or decides upon a course of action. It can be good or it can be bad. You, you decide it's a will. You do that. So, how do we figure out what to aim for? Now, this may disappoint you because it's so simple. We read our Bibles. We pray. And we press towards the mark. 
the bullseye. We don't have to worry. We don't have to stress. We don't have to fret about this. God has made his will clear. He's made his will clear in his word. It is the primary way he speaks to you and I today. Jesus told us in the book of Matthew, he said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Now, we know what that means as far as ministry. We've already been commissioned by Christ to present the gospel, to make converts, to make disciples. Paul, he prayed for the church in the city of Colossae this way. He said, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. New Living Translation. I just like the the translation of that. There is work that God calls all of us to do. And it literally is laid out for us in the Bible. God makes it clear again and again that we're to love others, we're to care for the poor, we're to live our lives in such a way that we teach others the power of the gospel. The Great Commission is explicit. We are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. There's our word again, teaching. And 1 Peter says this, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. I'm going to stop just a moment because I really want to, always, when I come to this word, I want you to catch it. We've mentioned it a couple times, but it's first that we've actually read it through in the book of Peter. A peculiar people doesn't mean you're strange, it doesn't mean you're odd, it doesn't mean you're different. It's two Greek words put together. The one is per, and that means you've been purchased. You've been redeemed. And the peculiar means encircled. So, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people who is encircled by the power of God. Nothing can get to you unless God allows it. A beautiful word. It's not strange, odd, or weird. It means you've been redeemed and you're protected by the power of God. So you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, I, I love the wording. He could have just said, called you out of darkness into light. But he didn't. He said, a oh, marvelous light. Puts emphasis on it. So aiming for the mark, making converts by teaching them the gospel. We're to see to it that they are baptized and are continually taught the gospel as they are discipled. This will help us to know which fights to pick and which to avoid. Sometimes we just look for anything and everything to pick a fight with other Christians because they don't, they don't, uh, it's so like the, the, the old comic routine has been around probably ever since who knows when, where the butler answers the door and he tells the guys, walk this way. So the three stooges come in and they, they walk this way. And sometimes as Christians, that's how we are. You, you want to join our church, you want to be a good Baptist, then walk this way. Shame on us, you know. So we make the converts by teaching them the gospel. We, we need to uh, be careful what we choose to get involved with as far as fights to fight. The church must speak the truth in love. Today it seems that folks want to talk about love and not truth. But you cannot have love without truth. Love without truth is like the cross without the resurrection. It's meaningless. Of 
told a pastor that one time. He said, what are you saying? I'm saying, you're, you're telling me how you love these folks, but you're not preaching the truth to them. You're presenting something that's not true. You're affirming relationships that God finds detestable. It's, it's like the cross without the resurrection. It means nothing. And it wouldn't. What if we had Jesus went to the cross, said he died for the sins of the world, but he never came out of the tomb? What a farce that would be. I mean, where's the power in that? It would be utterly meaningless. Love and truth go hand in hand. The church, especially liberty, should be the most truthful, loving place on the planet. And I, I believe that with all my heart, that we should be. We should strive for that. Every church ought to feel that way. They ought to feel that their church is the most truthful, loving place on the planet. You know, when folks come here, you may not find the lights and the big choir. You may not find the, um, um, oh, maybe the emotion, the cadence in the preaching. But I'm going to tell you one thing that you're going to find to the best of my ability is the truth. You're going to find the truth. And all those other things may be okay. But if you rest in those for the assurance of your salvation, you're going to be very disappointed. We need the truth. Our aim in teaching the gospel There are many, many pastors out there that could preach rings around me. And I know that. But I'm not for sure if there is as many that is really mining the truth without being detoured in different directions. My purpose is to teach the truth. As we encounter people, where they are, we tell them like it is. That's very important. With the hope of bringing them to salvation. We encounter them where they are, we tell them like it is, we bring them where they ought to be. In their relationship with Christ. Once they've accepted salvation, we continue teaching to encourage progressive sanctification. That's not a second work. That's just learning the rudiments of the gospel and adjusting our lives to it. Some people, they get saved, and maybe they have a, uh, maybe they have a situation where they've, they've always bought lottery tickets and never thought anything about it. Maybe they've always smoked cigarettes and never thought anything about it. I'm not saying any of those things are sinful or sending you to hell. I'm just using this for an example. Some people might have uh, drank occasionally and never thought anything about it. And once saved, I've heard many testimonies along this line. You know, I got saved and I went in to buy a lottery ticket and I just felt like, man, I probably shouldn't be doing this. Conviction. Why? You know, who knows? Same way with drinking, same way with smoking, same way with being creative on your taxes. I did this last year, but I'm, I'm not so for sure if I should be doing that this year. Funny thing happened on the way to the bank, you know? And that's how the gospel is. We... It, it's progressive sanctification. We, we grow in our relationship with Christ. We grow in our adjustments. We, we might have sat around and watched uh, good action movies, and the cuss words never bothered us at all. We got saved, and all of a sudden we thought, ah, I probably shouldn't be watching this, you know? Just little things. Progressive sanctification. We grow. If you're not growing, you ought to be... It, it, my oldest son, he loved a little, uh, those three wheel bikes you got on and plastic things, toys, big wheels. I mean, he just loved those. He would go around a patio and just rip the edge and, and gonna, he graduated on to bigger things. But uh, what, if, what if you came by his house and he's 45, 46 years old and you see him out of his driveway on a big wheel? You know, 
You think, what's wrong with him, you know? Same way with the Christian. As we grow, we need to we get off the big wheel. We, we, the progressive sanctification matures us. So, we have God, the creator of the universe, has called us to be part of his work to bring justice and kindness to his creation, to present the gospel, to teach it by aiming to hit the mark. What a joy! What a privilege. Are we able to embrace this calling with equal parts of fervor? Equal parts of fervor and wisdom and humility. And all that comes about by learning to teach the gospel with an aim to persuade. You have to work at it. So, next week we're going to be looking on the persuasion part. I I thought this morning, I I thought, you know, I could probably go back through this definition of evangelism and do another four-part series, uh, part A-2, part B-2, and and still not cover it. And I I think we really need to be reminded of the importance of our job as far as evangelism goes. My job is to equip the saints so that you can do the ministry. What is the ministry? To make converts. It's not rocket science. Some people, they they wait their whole lives. I'm just waiting for the Lord to show me what to do. Hello? Go to Matthew, into the book there. He's already told you what to do. We're going to ask you to stand.